closer than this one. Here, 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 here. So think of questions. The other thing we're doing in this, as we move into this section, is to talk more about individual, I'm searching for the word. The word could be cities. The word could be political cultures. The word could be scenes. Uh, the word could be neighborhoods. They could be, in China, county districts. There's 16 county districts inside Beijing. And we've analyzed them, for instance. Um, but the general point those all make, I've sometimes put on the board as um, we have a, a model like this. Got these community characteristics. We've got leadership, organized groups, and so forth, bureaucracy, policy outputs. And what, what we're talking about here is city, context, scene, political culture, neighborhood. That is, how and why do these patterns shift? How and why do they change? And so, and so we want to start with a sort of question, is China different? But we don't want to end there. We, we. Um, Max Weber did a book called The Religion of China. Why did he, why did he do The Religion of China? I'll ask the Chinese. And, and, and then I'll ask the Americans who read the Protestant ethic when they were in college, or you're in the college, you're reading, why are you reading a Protestant ethic and how does it relate to the religion of China? Or we had someone, yeah, we had, we got, uh, not here yet, Dalai Shah, he's right, right in Mumbai. I asked if he, had he read the religion of India? No. Max Weber, you ever heard Yes, okay, so. Why did Max Weber, go to China or re, you know, read about China, read about India, read about other countries, he's trying to say, where and why does my analysis work? And what was his analysis he was testing? What, he, what was he trying to understand? He's trying to understand development, the same core idea in this course. He sometimes called it capitalism, he sometimes focused on bureaucracy, he talked on, he talked on the Gothic church, as a structure which was not found in other countries of the world. He talked about music, harmony, melody. This is not just making money. And so, so he says, what is capitalism? It is not hedonism. It's not greed. Those, it's, not, it's not maximizing income, whatever. Those have been there for centuries before more, con let's say, he, he may have used terms, he didn't quite use the term modern, but let's say, before the emergence of these kinds of things from the Middle Ages on, <coughs> um, there are different patterns. And so his, his, his key idea in the Protestant ethic was what? Yes? Um, that the Protestant value of asceticism drives work um, and consequently drives Yes. Okay. So when he, so then why did he, how did he, perfect. So then how did, how did, but maybe he's wrong. Maybe, maybe, maybe the Protestant ethic is spurious. And maybe it really was, there's more capital in Northwest Europe. So maybe the driver was capital and it, and it wasn't the Protestant ethic at all. So he didn't have a big, he didn't have the world values survey data. He didn't have you know, 200 nations to play with quantitative. I mean, he, he would have loved it. I mean, he, he, he started coding, he started content analysis and different things, and he started 
lots of kinds of empirical work, but in you know, 1900, 1905, 1918, that was impossible. So what did he do? He, he, he used a more classic German scholarly approach, and he went to some key places, key locations. <coughs> and these included China, because China has, China and India had civilizations thousands of years before the West. So why did you not have a continuous growth and development of China long before the West? When when the people in the West, you know, they were they were Macbeth type people. They were they were, you know, they were tribes fighting each other, killing each other off. When the Chinese were civilized and you know a thousand years ahead of the Europeans. So why why not in China? That was the question he was asking. What was different in China? And what did he answer? Chinese and Indians. <laughs> to, we can. I mean, we can't. We're not going to go in detail. This is a. This is a different course. But, but the, the logic of thinking this way leads us into why the cities differ. And so we want to use the gen. That is why. Are we, and why are we studying cities? Some of you want to be mayors, but ma but many of you don't. Ma many of you want to understand the world. And my my general point is. And and I've, I I started studying cities because they are fruit flies. You can understand the world better by having hundreds and thousands of them that vary instead of only studying one or five or, or eight. Okay, so he asked this question, <coughs> and the, the people who now do this professionally in, in, in uh, okay, in, in later years are sometimes called uh, comparative politics specialists. There's a there's a section, there's a national a professional association called I think compar comparative. It's not, it's not called comparative politics. It's called some. It's not called politics. It's called something else like comparative, comparative comparative studies or whatever like that. It includes mostly political science, but public administration people, public policy, some sociologists, some geographers. But the idea is comparing all around the world. So geographers should do this, and that geographers have the data, but most geographers don't have much theory. A uh, few. <coughs> Sociologists are sometimes doing this. Anthropologists, clearly, the idea of young anthropologists is you go to, you go to a tribe, and then in the old days, you'd go to you know, a tribe that no one else had studied, and you'd, and you'd say, ah, here's a brand new, now you, they can't do that anymore. Everybody's reading YouTube or watching YouTube on their iPhones in the middle of the jungles of Brazil. Okay, so, so the anthropologists are coming back and they're studying cities and neighborhoods. And they're, they're, now they're called urban anthropologists. And so they, they, all these, these things are intermingling with, with each other. But the idea, the, the idea is compare. Because when you compare, as Durkheim said, science begins with comparison. If you don't compare yourself, your city, your neighborhood, you don't know that you're different or not. And so uh, <coughs> um, Durkheim's phrase is one. A another way that this got specifically implemented was, a, was in a, on a book by uh, two, two, two smart people who worked on this stuff for a, a long time, Henry Tooney. Uh, and uh, uh, was it? He, had, he had a Polish. He, had, he worked with a couple of, of, of uh, co-authors. Um, Shavorsky, C H W A R S K K I, I'd say. But he also worked with Ostrowski. I think this was O S T R O W S K. Uh, so if he's Polish, this is I or Y? I. If it's Y, it's Russian. Okay. <laughs> so Tuni and Ostrowski had a had a had a had a paper, and then then they then they general then then Tuni and Shavorsky generalized in a book, basically saying. What unit should we study to understand where and why things vary? And sort of asking this kind of question. Should we study nations? Should we study cities? One city, should we compare them? 
And, and the, the answer, one answer they gave was, let's look where and why things vary. So, so some, some people, for instance, like, uh, so last time I talked about the, the, the concept of political culture initially began with the idea of the, 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 the national culture, the German culture that the intellectuals created, the French culture around Versailles. And, and the English who had their culture. So those were national cultures. However, if you look within France, within Germany, you find differences, big differences. The French, and, and so I say this because for, for decades, I did my PhD, I mean, I, I was a study, I studied in France, did my PhD in France, lived, lived in Paris for five years. I, wor I worked and argued with the French for years on this. You have two, two simple views. The Parisians, who see everything is the same, and Paris dominates the French system, and it's uniform. And the Minister of Culture says, it's 10 o'clock, everybody's reading this book in all, of, in all the schools of France. Okay. Then you go down and you talk to the mayors, or you have a conference and you bring five mayors from around France and five people who are doing other things, and then some Parisians and some, and some academics and, some, and some, some people together, and they, and they talk. And then the, the Parisians will say, yes, everybody's the same in France. And the mayors say, no, no, no. My city does not do what you say to do in Paris. OK, and then I'll come back to a Chinese example. About the time, I'll say, 10, 10, maybe 10, 15 years ago, the national Chinese government, along with many other governments in the world, were saying, we've gotten too big, we were, were, we're spending too much money, and we're not responding enough to citizens. And so that the idea that citizens are more legitimate, we need to be responsive to within, within China. So what did the national, anybody heard me say this? What did the national government say and do at that point? We will fire one third of all national government workers. Trump, Trump in this budget, is he saying anything like that? No, Trump is not changing anything compared to what the Chinese did. They fired one third of the whole national government staff. I mean, Trump, Trump and the Republicans haven't dreamed of anything like that. Okay. Over a period, I think, of five years, so it went into place over five years. About, about three years after the national government did this in China, they then said, it's now time to do the same thing for all provincial and local governments in China. Fire one third of all the staff in the, in the regional and local governments of China. And then what happened? Nothing. We think China is a party dominated one, 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 one coherent system, nation? No. The localities ignored the national government. OK? So there's more within China and within France. That is, I'm not using American or Australian examples. I'm using the strong case of the French and the Chinese to say there's a lot of local variation in how these things work including such a basic issue as thou shalt fire one third of your staff, yes or no? And they said, sorry. Okay. So in, in that sense, if you talk to the people who are there on the ground making decisions and knowing how to get around the laws in different ways, you get a very different story. This is law, letters, and society. So the law was, Thou shalt fire all those workers. What the, the fact was, the letters in society said, no, and they didn't. Okay, so, <coughs> uh, so what do we do as analysts or policy policy advisors or social scientists? First of all, one of their suggestions was, it depends. We don't know where at what level a decision may be made. And so, so they, these guys, no accident, were from Poland. Po they, were from, they were from Poland under communism. They were working on this, these issues. We had a conference at the time 
wherein another guy, not one of these, a, a younger guy came to one of our conferences in the Netherlands. And uh, <coughs> he said, oh, you can't compare Poland with, your, with these Western and other countries. And we said, why not? Oh, because we, we have a different system. It's Polish. I said, well, okay. So what, what, what does that mean? We have national control of local government, so the local governments cannot, cannot control what they do. I mean, it's the national government that makes the decision. So we said, well, how, how can you measure that? The budget. So what, okay, what proportion, so what specifically? Well, the per percentage of the budget to all local governments that comes from the national government, which is, we asked, well, maybe, maybe 60%. So 40% of the budget was spent, was raised locally, and 60% was from the national government. Next question to the poll. What percentage is that in the Netherlands, here in The Hague, we were meeting in The Hague? He said, I don't know. What's the answer? About 90%. Dutch local governments get 90%, got them at least 90% of their money from the national government. Were they more communist than Poland in before 1989? Okay, so just knowing the money does not tell you how the decisions are made. Just knowing the law does not tell you how the decisions are made. You need, so that, that and these guys, these guys knew that. So they said, then what do we do? So their answer was, let's get data, for instance, on spending. The budget for all of the, and they, have, they had about four levels of units. So in China, well, you'll use China today because it's bigger and we, got, we don't have anybody here from Poland, I guess. Anybody from Poland? No, okay, so let's use China. So in China, you have the national government. You have provinces. You have um, cities like Beijing. Underneath that, you have counties or county districts. And underneath that, you have villages. One, two, three, four, five. Five levels. Okay, who makes the decisions? What they basically said was, let's look at where and how these things vary. So we then, we, we worked with people in the, in the Chinese Ministry of Culture, and they were saying, you know, we've got, we have, a, we have a goal of having equal access to public services across China. And so <coughs> we said, okay, so we have, have data for libraries, um, museums, and cultural, uh, C -c cultural c -c -c cultural centers, basically, where they can have plays, they, they can have uh, they can have music, they can have a variety of things. And where where are these distributed? So you can look at budgets, but but before we get to that, let's say we've got so where are these? There there are roughly three thousand of these in in China. So we could look at how many of these, so, so one thing we said, all right, let's look, do these things, these are amenities, do these generate urban development? Not, so we're thinking of the Protestant ethic, we're thinking of the numbers of amenities, we're looking at linkages here. <coughs> and we found, so we, we, so we did, we, did, we, uh, we, had, an, we had an assistant, and we, 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 we weren't sure where and how these things were distributed. <laughs> we're not Chinese, you know. We're, we're Western, so we're learning this stuff. And that, but I'm telling it to you to see how much how much you do or don't don't know as well, because these things are not so obvious. We found there are about three thousand of these across China. So one one analysis was: do does having a library, a museum, or a cultural center increase? Does this lead to more people moving, migrating there? Say thirty to say 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 thirty to forty, forty to forty, fifty. But we had good age cohort changes for 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 Chinese citizens, and then change changes in um, I think we had some kind of change cha change in rent or 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 I've forgotten what the measure was, but something like income or or local local GNP, so something like that. 
So we got population and jobs, jobs and, and, and income kinds of measures. And we did a regression, we found zero impact. If you had, if you had more, more or less of these, zero impact. Does that say culture does not matter in China? No. It says these, these are distributed equally across China uh, and that, that, was, that was step one. So just, I don't want to go too far, but um, if we then, we, if we, that is, if we follow the, the Polish example as they, close to what they did, the next question, so the number of these institutions is this. The, the second question is, how big are their budgets? Because you may have one library, but it may be a big or a small library, it maybe has a bigger, bigger staff, it, have may, it, may have, it may have shows, it may have tutors, it may have a variety, of, so the budget. When we analyzed the budgets, we found the opposite result. So we have the, the, the if this is the museum in here, this path initially was zero, when we analyzed the number of them, when we looked at the, so this is the, the number of, 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 of these, if we look at the budget, it was positive. So if you had a larger budget for your library or your, your, your museum, you had an impact on more people coming to that area and more, more, more economic development. Okay. So what this, what this example suggests is looking at the difference between the number and the budget at the local level can give you a different, a different answer. But the more general point coming, remembering Poland is how much do these, where, where and why do the budgets change? We have in the room an expert on service delivery in China, Chinese local governments. Any, any thoughts on how, how could we answer this question? Where and why do we have variations in, say, hospitals? And how, how do we analyze it in this kind of a framework? Just, just, just a little bit louder so people can hear you on YouTube. Why? So, why and where are there more hospitals and where and why might the hospitals have more, that, more good service to make Chinese citizens more healthy? Where, where do the hospitals work better or less well? I mean, assuming assuming we have a measure of this. I think um, I think in the southeast of the China. Okay. And the rich provinces. Okay. So your 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 answer is so so you have China. So you say the southeast. Okay. The, the southwest. Sorry, so, southeast. Okay, sorry. <laughs> southeast. Shows shows how how much of an expert I am. Okay, but. But you see where I'm, where I'm going in a, in a second. This is similar to the, con, the, the city name. This is, this is similar, similar to the national name or the city name. So you can, you can say, for instance, in Shanghai, it's better. In Beijing, it's better. And in a small town, rural town, it may be less good. Um, that's not telling us why. See, Weber's idea is to get more at why and how does it work. So if you only know, if you only say China's different, Poland's different, the Southeast is different, why is the Southeast different? That's the question. See, that's the harder question to push yourself. What makes the Southeast have better hospitals or better health? The uh, most important reason is the local government have more budget, budget, have more money. Okay. Okay. Well, and that, and that, that, that mean that sometimes that, that is the whole answer. But even if that is true, the question is, why is it true? 
why does the local government succeed in getting more money? See, see, so, so, so over here, um, so it's, it's, I mean, each of these questions in a sense are, the answers and questions are right and wrong. That is, we're, tr we're trying to dig deeper, to, to, to push beyond the simpler and to get to more subtle answers. And, that, and you've heard me say this quickly in this class, that in the last 20 years, we've got, or say, I've talked about Max Weber. Max Weber had three or four countries. So he discussed national and local differences. He had, I mean, he's a brilliant guy. He saw all kinds of things that, that others did not. But he did not have these kinds of data. Now we've got tons of data. Uh, we've, we've got data for all of the, we've got for many, many of the provinces, cities, counties, and villages in the southeast, southwest, center, and so forth. Why and how do they vary? We can analyze more subtly. Yes? Before 
there's some loosening of you know government control. And <laughs> I mean, yeah. it could be an, an increase in, in, in dollar, you know, in yen transfers, rent transfers in money. It could be a change in civil rights, you know, political tolerance. It could be a change in, in so, so, so yes, I mean, all these things could be fast or slow. Mm -hmm. So you, you don't need a revolution to have these things change. Right, right, but just like, say, if we were to try to say, okay, what was the role of these, like, private companies, right? How would you, like, for like how would you isolate that effect and control yeah. for just uh, in, in in France for example when when Mitterrand 1982 I think became became president of France he formed a government as I said in the first class first class or second class with the communists mm -hmm. so the communists and the socialists nationalized mm -hmm. many private companies in France and so the, the the whole the whole net French labor force went from being 20% government to 40% government in one year. It was not a revolution, it was just a ch change, of, change, of, change of power. At the next one. So, so, th so these things can go up fast or down, or, or that is, so, so if you have, with using the same kind of numbers which they have, you can have the percentage of the, if we had something like a, a, local, a local GNP, which is private or public, or which which is in the service sector, or industrial sector, or manufacturing, so so. I mean, and the Chinese collect a lot of data on that. That is, they've got. I mean, the perspective, the, the official perspective of the Communist Party is ec the economy drives everything. So they got lots of economic data. We have two thousand. We have about. We have about. Uh, we have over one thousand variables. We have the, We have. We have the number of vending machine repairmen in each county of China, just as an example of how refined the data can be. That, that is, this are, these are standard Chinese cen census data. Vending machine repairment. That's very, that's subtle. So you can have, how much are those, so, so yes, those are, th those are, okay, but, but let me, I, I wanna make clear and simply once, one basic point about levels. How do you deal with where the change is. Is it national, is it regional, is it local, or whatever? <laughs> um, and this, the simple answer which they basically said was look for variations. So that is, if you have every city in China has, has let's say, one library and their budget is you know, 100 per person, then they all have an identical budget. Basically, if they're the provinces, say has uh, 500, you know, all the province. If all the provinces are the same, there's no variation from province to province or city to city. But if you then go to the county, and then and then if you go to the county districts, and you find that these vary from let's say 50 to 200 per person, then we say, aha, here is variation. So, so let me, I'll, I'll give you, I mean, I'll, I'll example, I'm trying to use non-American examples because everybody knows in a sense that cities differ and neighborhoods differ in the U.S. But everybody thinks, especially the people who teach and write laws and public administration and public policy in France and China, they think mostly and they write as if it's a unitary system. <coughs> Um, and, and yet if we look more closely, it's not. <coughs> so some of these things vary. <coughs> um, and so basically what, what the suggestion was, look for where, look for the level at which we have variation. So you can, you can, you can set up, I don't, I'm trying not to be no fancy methodology, but if you, you have to say why or that this is the budget, you can then have x1, x2, x3, you know, a bunch of, bunch of factors, B, B, N, B3, B2, B1, alpha. And so you do a standard regression equation like that. You could have a measure at the, count, at the province level, the city level, the district level, the village level, and then see which one has more of an impact. Or, and or, you could, you could take the measure, you could take this as your spending at each of these levels and see See, see, see how, see how, see how much they vary. So that is, you can look at both. You can change the structure of the of the model. 
Okay, so you don't need to have any fancy, stand fancy statistics to, to, to see that idea, to see where and why, at what level did, the, did these things change. <coughs> Uh, um, for example, French example, Montpellier, France, is the fastest growing city in all of France. It's booming. It's in the south. It's it's um, it's near Avignon and Aix. And the south the south is now booming in France. Paris and the north of France is in general decline of jobs and population in the last t 20 or 30 years. These cities in the south are increasing a lot, and they're increasing with younger, more highly educated people uh, who are starting new firms and who are, and are doing who are doing new and different things. And people are moving there. It's a little bit like the Sun Belt or the Southeast in England, and and and, and uh, in that in that sense. But just it, so so, I, I went. I visited. Said, you know, what are they doing in Mont Montpellier? Man, I've never been to Montpellier before. I've never paid attention to it. It's a wild. It's a it's a classic socialist city. The streets have the names of the great socialist political leaders of France. They have a huge library. They've got an amazing tro trolley system, tramways. They've got, they've got all sorts of beautiful socialist created um, material, um, high tech and, and other kinds of things. One, two, they have the biggest dance festival, I think, in the world. These other cities in the South have theater festivals, music festivals. They said, well, what can we do that's different? So it's a dance. So they have a dance festival that lasts maybe six weeks, and then they have maybe 300,000 people who come there for the dance festival. Uh, but, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm making the simple point that you have some of these individual cities that are doing lots of things. You go one city away, two cities away, and you talk to the mayors and look at the budgets of those cities, and they're doing nothing. They have no festivals. They have no fancy infrastructure. They're very low spending, low budget, low service cities, and this is France. This is not what they tell you in Paris. They say it's the same everywhere, but you look closely and look at data like this for France or for China, and there's a lot of local variation. Okay, so, but Durkheim said, this is the beginning of an explanation, and we can then try to see why, you know, what's going on. And so we're talking of the Southeast. You're, you're from Guangdong? What, well, if you want to mention you, we, we, we had this conversation in emails about a month or so ago. What did, what did we talk about as possible possible explanations, for instance, for, for Guangdong? What, to, just tell them briefly about Guangdong and why might it be different from uh, the rest for of For the China. development of the city? Yeah. It, um, because uh, historically, uh, uh, in a certain period, it was the only cities that, uh, that was allowed to, like, to, to trade with other countries. So, uh, but, but that started... When? Uh, maybe uh, in the late Qing, uh, Qing Dynasty. Uh, so, well, roughly what year? So. Um, about uh, maybe it's uh, like um, like. Uh, how many? How many hundred years ago? <laughs> maybe the nineteenth century. Okay, so nineteenth century. Yes. So a long time before Mao is the point. So, a long so, time before Mao. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, yes. But then, under Mao, were there changes as well? That is, that is. It, it's, a, it's an open trading, external oriented, and so I mean, so I'm just asking you to repeat the what are, what are, what might be five different factors that could have caused this today? Uh, that, that's the interesting question. What, uh -huh. what might be that is what are possible reasonable factors that, that you and I are not not sure how to choose them. Uh -huh. So one is history in a sense or tradition yeah, yeah. related to sort of openness, a spirit of openness. Which might be related to proximity. I mean, proximity to the to the ocean, so it's easier to have trade from through ocean contact. But also, was it on the silk, you know, Silk Road, or I mean, or communication over land to go to go to other countries? Maybe not over that, but through the sea. Okay, so, so through the sea. What well, what else? What might be other factors? Uh, the, another factor may be our uh, our economic reform in the 90s. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, 
big because um, uh, back to then there, there were a few cities that were uh, like allowed to to have a very spe special uh, economic uh, settings and um, yeah, and uh, a very important one was located uh, in Guangdong in Shenzhen. It's uh, very close to Hong Kong. Yeah, and that's the uh, that's the first fast uh, growing. Okay, so another idea then which that suggests is that, at, in, that in those years after 1945, it was proximity to Hong Kong. And so the competition with Hong Kong might have been effective. But uh, what, what else? So, so, so the point is, we can make a list of five, six, seven. Look, I'll tell you just one more, which amazed me. Uh, I can't remember how many years ago this was, maybe 20, 20 25 years ago. Uh, I had a group call me up from UIC, which said, you know, I'm hosting a delegation of Chinese. Can, we, can, you, can you come and talk with them once or time, a couple of times and maybe have dinner with them? I said, fine, so it's that way. There were maybe 80, 80, 100 of them. They were all about 35 to 45 years old, smart young men, young middle-aged men, <laughs> and uh, chosen from all over China. These were up-and-coming policemen. They came here to Chicago for, I think, six months. They had internships in the Chicago Police Department, they had courses at UIC, they had visitors like me who came and talked with them, and so forth. Why, why were they here? They were preparing to become the police leaders of Hong Kong, after Hong Kong became part of China. <laughs> so, I mean, who would have imagined, so if you look today, and why and how is police delivery, that is, we have this Hong Kong protests and demonstrations in the last one year or so, big stuff. You know, it's in all the news. The police, the Chinese, the Hong Kong Chinese police are also handling it in a very delicate way. They're, they're not just coming in and arresting. They're not, it is not a Tiananmen Square. They're, you know, they're not coming in with guns or tanks or whatever. It's being, I, mean, I think for something like one month, Police just said, you know, demonstrate if you want. Okay, so my simple point is service delivery is subtle, and if we try to explain why and how it emerged, one factor is the training of the staff. And and I would I would never have thought of suggesting that except because the Chinese did it and I happened to see it sitting here in Chicago. And, and they, this training was going on maybe three to five years before Hong Kong was merged with the rest of China. So people, so people think longer term in China than in much, than in, not always, but sometimes in, in, this, in this example. All right, okay, so, <coughs> what, so what, what we're talking about, or the bigger theme we're talking about in multiple ways is where and why do these variations come in? How can we explain them in, and that is, so you hear us, we can, we can think through some examples that other people may have talked about, tradition, geography, climate, transportation, access, and so forth. <coughs> but then, how can we test them? How can we assess the evidence? And what I'm getting at here is if you get data at the village, the county, the city, these levels, and you can see at what, at what level are there variations? And if you find that the, that the only variation is at the county at one level, then you can say, aha, let's focus on the people who are making those decisions at that one level and not, and not try to say it's at the province or the city or the village, it's really the county district, county district level. <coughs> but uh, similarly, what then, what then has happened, let me throw in one, one more example of what, what has happened in, in the US and around the world since the two big dates I've talked about repeatedly in this course, 1968 and 1989. What's happened everywhere since 1968 and 1989? Revolutions? Revolutions? I mean, a, a few places have had, I mean, quasi-revolutions. I mean, in, in Paris, in Paris, de Gaulle resigned. 
uh, <coughs> uh, but but you had you certainly had demonstrations. But but what were the demonstrations for? What did they want? Um, basically, like murder which country? All of these countries. Like the end of like a authoritarian regime. Something. Yes, they wanted the government to be less authoritarian. And they wanted the and they wanted the citizens to be more important. So citizens have been getting more important all around the world in the last 20, 20, 30, 20, 30 years. Okay, how can we measure that? How might that change what's going on here? That is, we should be able to put in citizen community, including citizen characteristics. For instance, if the educational level of the citizens is higher. Does that increase the use of the libraries, and does that in turn increase the, the, the GNP? I mean, that's the Gary Becker human capital argument. That if, if people get more educated, they'll have more human capital. Even if they have the same money, the same technology, they'll use it more creatively if they're, if they're more educated. <coughs> okay, so um, the point is, this is a framework that what I'm not, I'm not trying to, as I said, I'm not trying to teach you statistics at all. I'm trying to have you think, how can you set up a research design, even if you never do this, even if you're a lawyer that is an old-fashioned style lawyer, <laughs> that is in 20 years lawyers may, you know, may be running regressions using this stuff. You'd be running regressions on a cell phone you know, just by talking, whatever. <laughs> and, uh, okay. But, <coughs> um, before you can run a meaningful regression, you've got to have, you've got to frame the issues in terms of a research design and thinking about how you, and so that's what, that's what this essentially does in very simple terms. It says get data at each of these levels and now this is getting easier and easier. You're in, a pro, you're in an MA program called what? Computational Social Science. Okay, and one of its, big Computational Social Science. It's a, it's a brand new program. James Davis, J J James Evans has started, and he started it in part, and Luke Ansling is a new professor of sociology and computer science. These two guys are doing lots of new stuff. And one of, the, one of the things which is new with them is big, big data. We've got tons of data we did not have five years ago. And you can download tons of stuff from the internet now. And you can download Twitter tweets. So we had, we had uh, Ben Picker in a, in a class last, last year. He's an economics, economics student <laughs> in a college. He said, yeah, I downloaded 750,000 tweets from all the city council members in New York, Chicago, and LA, and it took me 15 minutes. 15 minutes. And in the old days, you know, you'd code, you'd have 20 research assistants, and they'd code it for six months, and you'd get, you know, 250 or something. So now we've got 750,000 in 15 minutes. The question is, how do you use it? I mean, how do, we, how do we structure it so we can meaningfully analyze those data to answer the bigger questions that Max Weber and Marx and, and, and others are, are talking about? So, so one, one point here is go beyond the names of the countries, go beyond the names of the regions, and try to find analytical variables like human capital, amenities, or types of amenities, and then match together, at least posit potential, if we have more citizens who are more highly educated in Guangdong, and they have more trade, and they've historically had more trade, and they may have, maybe have more capital, higher budgets, and they have, um, maybe more, more tourism. We haven't talked about that, but maybe tourists bring more information and more of a sense of comparison with so, so, the, so tourism. So that is, we can then measure how much each of these variables may explain across 3,000 county districts in China. Um, and the same thing in Poland, the same thing in France, and, and basically, We've been doing this now for over, over 30 years with people, and we now are working with people in 35 countries. It's called the Fiscal Austerity and Urban Innovation Project. And we've been, we've been having, we published, we published, what is it now? 
I think we published 50 books when the new political culture came out. So you know, we're some uh, probably we published. We're not counting anymore. We probably published 60 to 70 books, and this is in turn led to the Scenes Project. But basically, this is the background, which is the core, the core ideas and the data. And but a critical part of it is the people. That is, we learn from every conference, such as the exchange between the Dutch, the Poles. The, the, the Brits, the Americans, we're French, we're all there talking to each other. And we'll, often, we'll often not really know what the answer is. We'll often disagree. We'll sort of articulate what we've heard in our, in our own surroundings. And then we say, well, we don't really know. Why don't we compare? Let's, let's, let's run this in Norway, in France, and Poland, and uh, let's meet again in three months and see what, see what we find. So we meet in three months. Ah, oh, look, boy, here's what I found. So then, then and we, and we learn. Okay, so it's been 50 bucks later, we, you know, we learn more. Okay, so um, look at where there's variation. Let me let me now bring in two the to link this to two readings in this in this section. The first first we talked about last time is Vildovsky. <laughs> okay, so Vildovsky was <clears throat> was probably the, the most talented political scientist of his generation. He was a student of Robert Dahl. <clears throat> he um, he was, he was founder of the, of the School of Public Policy at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he was professor of political science. Uh, and, um, um, uh, and as I mentioned, in the beginning, first half of his career, he worked, his theory was incrementalism. That government grows incrementally. So your question was, what if it grows incrementally? And the answer is, Vildovsky's answer was, that's the way all governments are most of the time. They just grow like that. No story, nothing fancy, you know, etc. Then along came 1974. So this is after 68, but 74 in California. What happened in 1970? It was a month. I got the date right. No, 78. What happened in 1978 in California? Who's from Who's in California? Nobody's from California. You all should know this wherever you're from, including China. Proposition 13, it was called. Yeah, Sophie, you're from California. <laughs> I lived there for like a year. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Prop 13. Okay, why is this important? This completely changed Vildovsky's paradigm of how to do political science, and I mean, and, and of, of, of his of his uh, very successful career. He, he, he was doing, yeah, uh, it's Hannah? Okay, Hannah. Is this the tax reform? Yes. Bill? Yeah. No, Prop, Prop 13, as I, I mentioned here briefly, <laughs> the, this, there was a, it was a referendum. It's easy in California to initiate, to initiate a referendum. You have something like 50,000 signatures, and you can, you can put it on the ballot. And the ballot, the, and the, the critical point is, it is then binding on the government to say, if you have, you know, 50% of, of, the, of the votes say do this, the government must do that. That does not happen in most of the world. You may have refer so-called referenda elsewhere, but they're serious in, in California and sometimes in Ohio school, school districts. Okay, so Prop 13 basically put on the ballot, we say we will cut property taxes by half. Uh, on every home and, and, and a building in, in the state of California. And so everyone, Jerry Brown was the governor, the political parties, the civic groups, the League of Women Voters, everybody. And so they went around in Oakland, California, and they put up signs. You know, if you close, if you, if you vote on this Prop 13, this swimming pool will be closed, this library will be closed, or we will have to curtail services, et cetera, this hospital will have to have reduce, its, reduce, reduce the people it, it gives shots to and so forth. And what did the citizens of California do? 66% said yes, cut the taxes. Same thing happened two years later in Massachusetts. Same things happened in Michigan. And all roughly, roughly two thirds voted the same way. Okay, it was the tax, it was the beginning of the taxpayers revolt, so called. From the bottom. <coughs> Did they want less service? No, they didn't want less. They wanted good services, but they also wanted less taxes. Can you do both of those? That's the beginning of the new political culture idea. 
that at least the, these leaders said, I will give you the same or better services and I'll give you lower taxes because we will increase productivity because we'll, we figured out better ways of, of doing this than, they're, than they've done in the past. Okay, so that obviously this is controversial. The traditional left and right say it's impossible, it's hypocrisy, but we've got examples. So we have, we have, we have a number of examples of, 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 of all of the above. That is, cities differ. We find a, a, lot, a lot of variation in, term, in terms of these kinds of things. Half past, okay. Um, <coughs> So um, that's the title of this section. So I'm, I'm using Voldowski as an example. Prop 13, he said, wow, my theory was wrong. This is not incremental change, this is revolution. And so the property taxes dropped. The schools suffered the most. That is the schools, the schools have been the most um, hit. And so they've, they've done a variety, but also the university. In the university, the, the, uh, the public transit, the, I'm sorry, public transit a bit, but also the, free, the freeways. Free, freeway construction has is, 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 is dropped way off, whereas the father, the father of Jerry Brown was Pat Brown. Pat Brown built the University of California system. He built the California freeway system. And his son supervised, you know, <laughs> the opposite, kept cutting, cutting away back. <coughs> but so. Um, what did Vildovsky do to deal with this conception? It's a little bit in this paper, but I'm, I'm, in, I'm telling, you, telling you more. And, I, and I've already told you a little bit about this along the way. Anybody remember any pieces you want to? He wrote a book, or he wrote, wrote about 15 or more books, but one, one, one was called The History of Budgeting and Taxation in the Western World. So he started with the ancient, ancient Jews, the Bible, and he went up to present. He wrote it with an historian who knew more of the historical stuff, but he said, how did the political culture change? And did he, did he talk in terms of the nation? That is, as he, as he, as he did this, Sorry, and the, sorry. This was one book he did. A second book he did with another woman who was the top, probably British anthropologist, was Mary Douglas. She worked on food and culinary style and so forth. And they they wrote a book together called Risk and Culture. And with with Mary Douglas, he developed an idea that there are four kinds of political cultures. <laughs> and one is slavery. One is bureaucracy. One is market. And the other is sort of, I, I, I forgot, forgot what this is, but basically four types of strongly different political cultures. And these he basically used to reinterpret the whole history of the world for 2,000 years. And that is, instead of saying, in 1850, this happened this way, he tried to say, which moved more toward a market or away from a market, which moved and, and, and uh, just a point one is the label. Point two was these, these styles fight against each other, that you have more market because the market is fighting against uh, the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy in turn is fighting against slavery or, or, you know, or authoritarian styles. So each of these four <coughs> exist, may exist in different, you know, within, and so when, when he wrote about when he wrote about the ancient, the ancient Jews in the Bible, I mean, his main source for everybody was, was the, the Old and the, and the New Testaments. <laughs> and, and in, but instead of saying there's a, that is, so Max Weber wrote a book called Ancient Judaism. Vildovsky wrote two books on Moses alone while he was writing this other book and to, to show clearly that the ancient Jews went through many, many changes of political culture inside Israel as they fought each other and as they changed their, 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 their as they were then invaded, that Jerusalem was destroyed again and again, it was burned, they had ethnic cleansing, I and mean, all that stuff was going on again. And so, so no nation, but and many, so it, that is, it went from slavery to bureaucracy to market to this and back and forth across individuals and, and, and so forth. Yes? No, I'm just Okay. So, so um, all right. So we can go into that more, but the, 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 I'm giving you enough there of, to maybe encourage, encourage you to read, read, read and think about, uh, um, 
and, and we've, we've, talked, we've talked a bit about political culture in the last section and, 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 be, and before that. Let me say just a word on the, the um, oh, sorry, now just related to that, I, 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 got, I got the words, this, which, which, you, which you all should, all should know at least a word or a word or two. That is, we contrast within the U.S. the regional differences, and I have here, my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loose, loosed, loosed the fate, the fateful lightning of his terrible swift, swift sword. His truth is marching on. Um, let me see. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free while God is marching on. Okay, so the, the point is this is very divinical, very religious, but it was used as a military marching song. It's used in churches today and it was used to, to sort of rally a sense that we are morally right and we are fighting against the people who are wrong. So, so the point is, so is, where and how does a sense of we're right and just get, get infused? And that really is the idea of political <coughs> culture, that each of these four say, if you want to build a, if you want to have equality, after, 19, after 1789 in France, we must abolish the aristocracy, we must abolish the, the uneven distributions which the church and the nobility, the local nobles have been stealing the money or using it for themselves. We must instead have the French Republic. And so the Republic, the bureaucracy, will evenly distribute services everywhere in France. Okay, so that that, that's, that, and that today remains a, a substantial, uh, a substantial um, differentiating that is France today is very different from Germany, from Italy, from England, from the US. And we will have here three lectures, I think it's uh, Thursday, Friday, and Monday by one of the leading experts in France on this, uh, whose name is, uh, if you wanna hear more elaboration, P. H. Menger, more of a German name, but uh, he's a French guy. Okay, he's talking in the French department, sociology department, and, a, and another another group, sort of sort of a mixed group, social science. Group. But look up his name if you want, if you want to hear hear him talk about it. Once on strati stratification of income, but what one, I've seen one of one of the papers giving on Friday to the French, it's the French Studies Commission or Committee, whatever of, of the of the university. One thing he shows is that the French citizens today have a strong sense of the welfare state should make us equal. And they're anti-capitalist, that capitalism is destroying equality. So the French, when I mean, you ask questions of the, the Chinese, the Chinese today, I'm pretty sure the Indians today, the Argentines, the Brazilians today, say yes, we need more, we need more markets. You ask the French, oh no, 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 markets are terrible. So the French today, even though it's you know, a Western so-called market economy, the French citizens in the surveys, comparable items, you ask the Chinese and Indians and others, the French are some of the most anti-market people in the world. Very interesting, rich, poor, etc. cetera. <coughs> um, and so Menger talks about this, about where and how do these, I, and, and because in France right now, as you know, they elected a new president about the same time that Donald Trump was elected. And, and one of his biggest things is to increase the size of the market and weaken the state in controlling industry because they have massive unemployment, especially by immigrants, North Africans, black Africans, are heavily unemployed. They're, they're angry they're, you know, that they're, they're not getting access to the French, French labor market, which is closed off. So, so, so the president basically is elected on the program of opening the French economy to immigrants and to young people who have, who are held who are, who are not okay, so, et cetera. So, my, my my point is simply that he's 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 got survey data of French citizens on this, 
and part of it is is this political culture in ways that's, that that very powerfully make France distinctive today. Okay. Next reading linking to this <coughs> um, is on one little town in the U.S. called Lawrence, Kansas, and. <coughs> Um, Paul Shoemaker was a it's young political scientist a couple of years ago, and 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 he 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 took the idea of Robert Dahl that we talked about several times of issue specificity. Of the, the, you know the politics differs depending on the issue, so you can have schools or what were Dahl's three issues? And who governs? Okay. You should all re remember this. What were Dahl's three issues in New Government? What were Dahl's three issues in New Government? What were Dahl's three issues in New Government? Dahl's three issues in New Government? Ah, okay. You passed the midterms, but it's not in your heads. <laughs> okay. All right. The, the, the specific answers are not important. What's important is the idea of issuaries. And the idea he illustrated with school board elections, mayoral elections, and the third was what? What we're talking about for Guangdong, economic growth. And the idea was the leaders in one may be different from leaders in, in another. And Dahl suggested, and then Paul Peterson built on this still further, substantially saying business may lead in <coughs> urban development decisions. Because business leaders and developers, and this, this point has been elaborated by many uh, social scientists, <coughs> uh, Business and development should be most important in business and development decisions. Okay, so Peter, so sorry. How about in Lawrence, Kansas? He got a list, not of three. He made a list of about 40 different, 30 or 40 different issue areas, all different kinds of things. Then he went out and he asked the citizens, what do you want? What do you favor the government doing about this issue, about libraries, about you know school crossing guards, about about sewage protection, about you know sidewalk repair. I mean, lots of specific services, very specific areas. And then also the big issue: should we have more growth and development, or should we have about the same, or should we have less? And what did he find on the big bottom line question? About the, about the, the just to make to give you the simple story first. What did the citizens, did, did the citizens of Lawrence, Kansas want to have more growth, the same or less? They're, these are not business leaders, these are average citizens, which is the, the creative point that, that uh, Schumacher was pursuing. That is the theory, the theory from Peterson, the theory from Saskia Sassen, now pointing out that these are theories from these people. The theory from Logan and Malich the theory of Marx is developers and capitalists and business leaders want development. And the growth machine, so-called, of Harvey Mollich is a way of pursuing this and building a coalition of political, and Clarence Stone, you know. Many of the readers, we, the readings that we've done tell you this as if this is fact. Okay, so in Lawrence, Kansas, no. Most of the citizens wanted the same thing was not a capitalist leadership, whatever. It was the average citizens and the city council members and the mayor and the developers all said, yeah, we'd like to have Lawrence grow. Simple but counterintuitive. Most of the literature was saying at the time, before he did the survey, said the opposite. The developers want growth because it builds capital and makes them richer but this is imposing this on the poor citizens who don't want growth. Not true. The citizens want to grow. Okay. Is Lawrence typical of the whole U.S.? We don't know because citizen surveys are very expensive. We have very few. We've got most of the citizen surveys are national because if you have 1,500 answers, 
you can analyze the national representative sample of American citizens. So 90, 97% of the surveys you read are, are, are national samples like that. But if you want to know, is Lawrence different from Detroit, different from Ann Arbor, different from Irvine, California, the answer is we generally do not know, with the exception of Irvine. So I talked to somebody from Irvine re re recently. <coughs> that is, Irvine had a, had a center led by Mark Baldessari, and over a 15-year period, he did a survey of, of this representative sample of citizens in every city in the entire Orange, Orange County, all the council members and all the mayors. So we've got so Orange County is the best studied county in the whole U.S. or probably the world because of these because of these surveys that were done, and they show dramatic changes in the in the policy preferences of the citizens over over a 23rd year period. Women became far more important. Women's issues, equality. The mayor of Irvine was was that is they have it's where you have John Wayne Airport. Okay, the mayor of Irvine, California, fought that. And he and a, you know, a couple of hundred people, arm in arm, stood in, in the, across the middle of the freeways at the middle of rush hour and stopped the traffic, saying, no more freeways in Orange County. We want public transit. Okay, so, so that kind of thing was going on, and so more people, so, and, and they, it reflected a change, that is, he was elected by citizens who wanted those policies. So even in places where you have a policy from the past, these these can change. So, so you you hear you hear what you hear are theories, methods, and examples of where and how these things vary in ways that that we need that we can start with formulating x leads to y leads to z, but then we've got to be sensitive as to where and why it may change. And I'm simply saying. We don't just need to treat this as idiosyncratic or there's no science or each, every city is unique. On one level, every city is unique, but if we've got, as we have now in our files, we have over 10,000 cities in 35 countries. We go to meetings, we talk about this, we publish, we publish over 50 books, and we learn a little bit more in each book and in each MA and each BA as each person, you know, so we see where and how these things work and it's and we and because we keep learning and it keeps changing, uh, it's exciting. And that, that's the, and one two, how did we get to be the most extensive city study of local government in the world? Because we got more money and hired people to work with us? No. They got their own money. We started the project. So initially, we were, we were invited by NSF, and at the NSF sociology and political science director said, you know. Why don't we start a national national urban stir survey like the <coughs> like the general election study and the uh, 4050 census project? Every two or three years, we'll do a survey and we'll fund it on a continuing basis for decades. So fine. So 20 of us got together. We published a book. It was a proposal to NSF, and then government changed, and those two guys and the, the NSF budget was cut 40 percent. So what did we do? Did we go home and quit? No. Eleanor Ostrom, who was the first woman and the first, first woman non-economist to win a Nobel Prize in economics, Eleanor made the suggestion, why don't we do it locally? I said, how? Well, I'll volunteer to collect the data for Indiana, the cities of Indiana, if other people will volunteer for other, other states. So I mean, we had people who were assistant professors with no money, so I, I can do it over my summer vacation. And then I, in turn, will get all the data from 50 other states. So by breaking it up into 50 pieces, having 50 participants, sometimes people would do two or three adjacent states and so forth, getting a little bit of money from, for instance, the, we got money from the Institute of, of uh, Governmental Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. <laughs> we got money from the, the University of uh, Virginia. Etc. So we got we got some local or regional grants like that, but small. But the key was a collaboration among people who volunteered and who wanted to keep analyzing and making sense of this and meeting and 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 getting bigger and better data than we ever had in uh, in, in the history of the whole urban urban area. Okay. So with that, <coughs> basically, we've got.
some key points. I mean, I, I can fill in a lot more, but I've been I've been talking almost nonstop. Why don't, why don't we have a little bit of discussion along along these themes and, and see where you want? That is where we're going to go in the next section. If you look at the readings, we've got we've got contrasting types of cities and leadership patterns. Now that's our next big section for two weeks. And so we'll deal with some of the big, I mean, some of the big famous examples, Chicago, New York, New Haven, and so forth. But and we don't have as many as we would like internationally, but I try. We, uh, uh, I've sometimes, I mean, in several courses, not, not this time, we've often had a Chinese teaching assistant, and at the end of each class I would say, how would it be different in China? Okay, if we don't have a Chinese teaching assistant, we have one, two, three, four, whatever, Chinese participants, and several pretty, pretty I mean, your, your, your English language is your main problem, but you've got lots of stuff in your heads, and we can draw on, China and other people in the class, as well as these studies and the, and the data which we have. But for now, discussion, questions, and reactions. Then, and some of you are working on things like master's theses and trying to figure out what am I going to do a master's thesis on. So, uh, go ahead. It's just a general question because, uh, as you mentioned, we uh, when we like need to find the variations, we need to do the but actually, uh, if we compare, like to compare two cities or, or uh, several cities, but uh, they have many aspects <coughs> that's different. So how to control all the like confounding factors and something? This says B one, B two, three over to B n. So there are so many things there. Are different. Edward Edward Glazer, the world's leading urban economist. Uh, and his fellow econ that is the economist from about 1850 to to 2000 said we're not going to study happiness that's that's too complicated you know, we, we talk about preferences and utility but we're not going to study happiness because that's you know, that well there, there are other, other fancy reasons since uh, since about since about 2000 maybe 1990 that's completely changed the economists are studying happiness a lot. And Glazer has done a paper where he has, I think, I think there are 150 independent variables of the causes of happiness. Okay. <laughs> happiness, okay. Ha music increases happiness for some people. <laughs> All right. So he had measures. He had, so he had, in addition to income and education and occupation and age and race and, and so forth, he had, he especially found that that is the most important variables in the 150, as he pointed out, were not the classic economic variables. They were things like, are you married? Are you happily married? Do you have children? Are you in a church? That is, people who had more social connections tended to be happier. Uh, not always, I mean, if this is, again, most of this, as I was in social science, most of the, you know, put in 200 variables and you usually explain about how much variance? 15%? Okay, so in general, 85% is still not explained. But the point is, if you get up to 15%, you're doing it, and it's, it's not that there's anything wrong with social science, it's that people are complicated. People don't, people, you talk about the, the Chinese, but as you know, there are many kinds of Chinese. Yes. Um, a different topic, but um, going back to Schumacher, um, so he like says at least like um, in the part that we were assigned, like he talks about like some like differences between like bigger and smaller cities, um, but like doesn't really define like kind of where that cutoff is. Um, and I was also wondering like if he talks about ever like a mechanism for like what would cause those differences. Like for example, um, he talks about how like um, utilitarianism kind of predominates in policy making more so in smaller cities and then just this kind of crops up in bigger cities. Like does he ever put forth like a mechanism for why that is? Good question. This is this is predominant this is mainly a case study of one town. Mm -hmm. Elsewhere he and I and, uh, and uh, another uh, guy at, at Kansas did a did a, a 
forgot what it was called. It's a setups manual, S-E-T-U-P-S. It's published by the American Political Science Association. And it was a comparative study with data, which we, we made available something like 200 variables, a little file to any, any person in a usually political science course. So students could analyze that themselves. So we, had, so we had propositions in that little report, and that in turn built on the earlier things which you have read in this course, especially the book called Community Structure and Decision Making. And that book in chapter five uh, has about 25 propositions of exactly the sort, or almost, almost, almost exactly the sort that you're talking about, as does the book called Scenescapes. So Scenescapes has more, has the difference between Scenescapes and and this is we, instead of studying cities, as in the earlier work, we go down to zip codes and individual citizens, and we include, and so the other revolution is, since the time of that book, the whole field, including I, <coughs> have added political culture. So in, in the 1960s, community power people said, I'm studying power. And they didn't, they didn't know about culture. They didn't talk about culture at all. They didn't talk about religion. They didn't talk about you know, beliefs in, an, in a systematic way. Since then, we've added that. And so, so, so these are the 15 dimensions within scenescapes include things that are closer to utilitarianism or moralism or equality or justice and so forth. That is, those kinds of values have become more articulated by as and why, why has this happened? I would say the, the, the many things, but the simplest answer is citizens have gotten more important. As citizens have gotten more important, they have said, I want those political leaders to be, I mean, to, to respond to my values as an average citizen. And if you get to equal 50%, women tend to be more moralistic around the world. Or that is to talk more in terms of these ideals explicitly. And to say, and, and so, if, if so, so in that sense, <coughs> the the and to you and not to have a segregated kind of um, set of moral standards for people and families and young and old and political leaders. That is, the old view was you know political leader. I mean they're you know they're like gods. That, that they, that, what you know they can do whatever they want in their job, but. The, this new idea is closer to the New England moralism. The New England moralism basically says we're all equal, and our values as a church, as a small town, as a community should also apply to, and so the, in 1789 they said, the king doesn't do that, we'll chop his head off. We want more egalitarianism. Okay. So values have come in more explicitly, and so, so and, and as have measures of those values. And so, yes, I mean, if you, if you and this is, this, is, this is how the big data has changed modeling. That is, if, you, if you've got, if you only got one case or 50 cases, you think, you think in, in terms of five or six variables. If you've got 400, if you've got 45,000 zip codes in the whole US, you can have 200 independent variables if you want. So you can control all sorts of stuff that you, that you can with a smaller end. So thinking, the framing, the research design can change as we get more, better better data uh, in answering your questions. Okay, you. onward, we'll see you, see you, see you Monday.